So, we have had uh, discussions on uh, coating by uh, physical methods, by diffusion control methods uh, from the solid state or the vapor state. We also discuss a large number of techniques based on um, uh, aqueous or molten bath including um, electrochemical deposition techniques. You also heard uh, various approaches of uh, spray based techniques which are uh, plasma or uh, plasma based techniques for example. We are now going to discuss the this is going to be the 45th lecture and we are going to discuss the physical vapor deposition as one of the possible methods of producing coatings, but for a difference these coatings are going to be thin fairly thin coatings uh, usually in the tens of microns range. I mean at uh, in special cases one can go up to millimeter, but usually they are just a few micrometer thick coatings. So, that is why these these coatings are typically called um, thin, thin films rather not even coatings. So, as the name suggests uh, physical vapor deposition the process requires only a change of state physical state. So, you can deposit a thin film of elemental metal or compound on any kind of injuring solids for a small area or a larger area. The process is based on thermal evaporation. So, essentially you take the material to be deposited and evaporate it by way of heating usually resistance heating. Uh, you would like to you do this primarily to improve the hardness or all the uh, most important rhabological properties uh, starting from friction to wear and uh, erosion and other processes. There could also be utilities based on improvement of functional properties uh, which can be anything from conductivity to um, reflectivity to um, uh, so make it amenable to various kinds of uh, other functional applications. Similarly, um, this also can impart resistance to corrosion, resistance to tarnishing at room temperature degradation or even uh, against oxidation. Uh, the difference as, as, as is mentioned already is in the fact that we are dealing with fairly thin films. So, obviously, we need materials in order to take to the vapor state we need materials with very high vapor pressure. So, that they can by heating we can easily take them into the vapor state and they can create a saturated vapor pressure around the material or component to be coated. The, um, so, first we uh, take the material that we uh, want to coat and the component that we want to coat both inside an enclosed chamber and then evacuate and create fairly high vacuum over 10 raise to minus 5 millibar or even higher vacuum. Um, we may have arrangements for heating may not have arrangements for heating. Heating separately I mean uh, ancillary heating uh, processes for the substrate. We should also have a controlled atmosphere. We may create a controlled atmosphere which could be simply rarefied chamber high vacuum or um, inert gas like argon or we can even have a reactive gas in some very special cases. But uh, remember the, the evaporation is done by heating but this heating here meant refers to the possibility of heating the substrate which actually you are getting uh, coated. So, you can coat pure metals like gold, titanium, silver um, in special cases maybe chromium or nickel or, or materials which actually, but generally you choose metals which actually have uh, fairly high vapor pressure. So, they can be coated or deposited and uh, this actually also is a standard synthesis or processing technique for uh, creating wear resistant coating or low friction coating on machine tool for machine tool manufacturing for semiconductor industry creating various uh, uh, IC uh, integrated circuits or various other kinds of uh, components. In jewelry and ornament industry this is very popular it can be also very very useful for precision instruments. Uh, to to create an uh, create a matching uh, coating to match the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion or friction coefficient and so on. Similarly, also is useful in metalware industries. Typical thickness we are talking about is only uh, two to five to six micrometer. 
uh, not even 10 micrometer, whereas in case of CVD one can go the chemical vapor deposition, which we will discuss after a couple of lectures, you can create slightly thicker coating. So, here what we actually have to understand is that this is coming from the vapor state and if you build on a very thick coating, the stresses at the interface is going to be fairly large, which is going to be harmful. So, we prefer to create a very thin coating, but we need to create, we need to uh, clean the surface well, remove not only the uh, any kind of oil or grease, but also any uh, presence of thin oxide layer, because that is going to then uh, uh, not allow good adherence of the deposited film onto the substrate. So, surface preparation is very important. <coughs> so, typically the chamber looks somewhat like this, it usually it is like you would have seen a bell top uh, jar. Uh, with a flat bottom, so that you actually can lift the bell and then bring it back. Um, so otherwise, it can be simply a fixed chamber, uh, uh, you do not necessarily have to remove the bell or something. So, it can be a fixed chamber and you have evacuation um, uh, process. So, this is how you actually can evacuate and uh, make it uh, make the inside the chamber extremely low pressure. You can backfill with uh, neutral gas, for example, argon, or you can also feed in oxygen or nitrogen if you want certain reaction to take place. But this is uh, not very uh, regular or usual, but feeding uh, argon is fairly regular because uh, once you evacuate, then you, when you feed in argon, argon remains neutral and then um, um, also creates uh, a situation whereby undue oxidation is avoided. So, this is the substrate, uh, the, the component that you want to coat or maybe this is the stage and on the stage you uh, can place multiple components like here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 components. And uh, now, once you actually, um, uh, once you actually uh, create um, this high vacuum and apply uh, high uh, amount of current. So, now you evaporate uh, these uh, materials and with the evaporation you actually create um, a certain amount of vapor atmosphere of the component that you want to coat. So, as you, uh, so, so this is let us say uh, this is the, uh, the component or the solid that you want to coat and as you, um, as you evaporate, uh, so this whole region uh, gets uh, completely filled with this uh, uh, vapor of the material. And this vapor uh, atmosphere now covers the entire uh, range of components that uh, you want to coat. So, when you, um, when you evaporate thermally, uh, say from these regions, you actually can also create by way of applying certain amount of um, uh, potential inside, you can create a plasma and that plasma actually can make the uh, deposition process more efficient. So, for example, um, if you have uh, a heating process which can be either res resistance heating or through an external electron beam which create which and you have your uh, material to be coated kept in a tungsten boat or some other um, holding material which can withstand very high temperature. And uh, so, you can have a separate heating arrangement either uh, by feeding current through this uh, tungsten board or you can allow the external um, electron beam to irradiate this place and then you create this atomic flux. And this is where you keep all your uh, components. For example, in this case, this could be silicon wafer where you want to for example, coat uh, certain areas onto the surface, but not all the areas where you do not want to coat you cover them up with a certain mask and then expose the rest of the parts which gets coated with the desired metal or the material. So, you have multiple advantages, this is a very versatile process and um, uh, the deposit, you can deposit almost any material which get goes to the vapor state, uh, very little chance of chemical reaction. In fact, you can avoid completely chemical reaction in flight or in deposit and uh, very little uh, damage to the substrate, because the substrate is at room temperature or near to room temperature. The chamber inside gets heated up little bit, but not very high. 
So, uh, when we uh, evaporate uh, from any of these evaporators and when we want to coat these uh, components, we actually can immerse them. So, this is a line of sight, but at the same time, uh, this uh, makes a very uniform coating because it is kind of immersed in the vapor, immersed in the vapor atmosphere. Now, um, there are also demerits. For example, this is a line of sight process. So, you actually can cover only the surface that you are seeing, the vapor is seeing directly. So, there could be a process of shadowing. See, for example, if you have a component uh, here and another component here, and if the vapor is arriving this way, a portion here may get shadowed. So, we have to make sure that the vapor arrives uniformly from the top or from one of the sides so that it can cover the entire area. In fact, the, the area of the vapor actually should be uh, wider than the components that we are coating. Then we can make sure that the component is very widely, uh, very uniformly covered. So, um, so, we have to avoid this shadowing effect, possible shadowing effect. There could be non-uniformity of the thickness. See, for example, if you are coating a wide area like this and if you have only a single evaporator here, you expect that the evaporation should actually cover the entire area like this uniformly, but the rate at which the, uh, the species will arrive here will not be the same when uh, this region is fairly wide, fairly wide apart. So, the coating thickness may vary from the center to the periphery. This is also um, uh, difficult. For example, if you are thinking of uh, coating tungsten itself, then it is uh, difficult because the melting temperature and the vaporization temperature is high. So, you would rather choose materials which are easy to evaporate, which has high vapor pressure and relatively low boiling temperatures. So, um, you can have instead of uh, enclosing in a chamber like that, you can also create uh, um, a, a, a tube furnace like uh, configuration, where you can keep the, um, the holders cool by flowing air, flowing uh, water through, the, through, the, uh, through these gaps. You can use these openings to pump out the gas inside, evacuate it and this is the source material and now you can heat it in a tube furnace. So, instead of directed heating, instead of uh, creating the, I mean in the previous case uh, if you see we actually had a boat here and this boat usually is a tungsten boat which can be heated to very high temperature. So, tungsten has the capacity of uh, producing going up to very high melting temperature and uh, in the process um, uh, it has fairly high resistance, resistance increases with temperature. So, because of this kind of um, uh, resistance heating, the whatever powder you keep here, they get evaporated. So, that is so how we do and we expect the uh, evaporation, evaporated species to go all over. In fact, if we have evaporators surrounding uh, the chamber, then of course, we can create a fairly uniform um, plasma inside or fairly uniform vapor vaporized atoms inside. On the other hand, we can make a, a relatively simpler process where we can take a source material and simply place it inside a tube furnace and uh, with enclosures, uh, airtight enclosures. So, we can evacuate, make it very low, um, uh, very uh, low pressure and then we heat up the tube furnace. So, that material from here gets evaporated and this is a colder portion of the furnace. So, maybe the heating zone is confined only here, so that the, so, so that the material is heated and vaporized only in this region and the vapor obviously, because of the temperature gradient will move towards the colder region and get deposited onto the substrate that you want to coat. So, that is also a possibility. So, uh, the, the temperature uh, that we can heat up to inside the furnace is not very high, maybe up to about 500 degrees centigrade, but uh, no actually this is a uh, micrometer. So, this can be fairly uh, thin coating. Um, so, the deposit that we create should be thin and adherent. So, and we want to improve the hardness, the wear resistance, the oxidation resistance 
and typical applications could be in industries like aerospace, automotive, surgical or medical, in manufacturing using dyes and molds and cutting tools, in various kinds of optical devices. Wherever we have use of thin films, even on, uh, on glasses uh, for tinting, for anti-reflection, for uh, coatings, photovoltaic uh, layer and so on, for food packaging. In various places, we have these uh, application of PVD. Uh, in rare cases, PVD can also take the help of certain reactive gases like nitrogen or hydrocarbon and then create a, a, a reaction layer onto the substrate. So, the kinetics uh, of the process uh, will depend upon the configuration that we use. So, for example, we can use a point source or we can use a small planar surface source. So, the, the, here the area is wider. So, we actually are able to care, uh, cover wider area. Here the area or the spot that we cover is fairly small. So, either a point source or a small uh, planar source. So, in case of a point source, the flux will be inversely proportional to the radial distance. So, this radial distance. The same thing is true for a wider surface area. The velocity in that case will be inversely proportional to the square of the radial distance. But in addition, it will also depend here. It primarily depends upon this theta k. Here it depends both theta k as well as uh, uh, the uh, theta i because of uh, the points obviously cannot cover wider area, but uh, planar if the source is not a point, but the source is uh, of certain surface area, then obviously it can cover a wider area and that is uh, seen here. The overall evaporation rate of course, will depend upon the mass and the temperature of the material. Actually, you can create uh, um, uh, special conditions of maintaining a specific temperature and mixture of argon and oxygen to uh, create certain uh, oxide layer. So, you actually heat up uh, tin and introduce very low amount of oxygen and allow certain reaction to take place and this reaction can lead to formation of uh, very uh, thin uh, tin oxide layer. And this tin oxide layer, the beauty of it is that actually by controlling the process parameters, you can change the aspect ratio very significantly. So, you can make such very thin wires and rods and uh, in fact, you can have a completely uh, very thin wire uh, mesh in the form of a wool. These kind of large aspect ratios where the diameter is only a few tens of a nanometer, but the length can be easily a micrometer or, or close to a micrometer uh, that can have very high applicability for sensing certain gases because the surface specific surface area of these kind of um, uh, shapes is extremely high. So, normal tin oxide film will have one uh, level of uh, sensitivity whereas, if you can create such high aspect ratio the sensitivity would be much uh, greater and to create such uh, exotic structures you actually can modify the conventional PVD and change the process parameters and allow feed in a particular rate and way, so that you can produce such uh, very thin uh, layers with uh, large aspect ratio uh, structures. In fact, uh, you can uh, by way of uh, re reaction based PVD, you can create uh, for example, here you have a nitrided steel and on top of that this is where uh, in A you have created titanium nitride, in B you have created titanium carbonitride and in C you have created a uh, titanium aluminum nitride. So, you have created a single nitride, you can create a carbonitride, you can create a, a combined nitride, a mixed nitride and this is possible not just uh, uh, it, it can be done in the same chamber. You simply have to uh, move from one he, one spot of heating to another. So, if you are heating by E beam, you can switch the beam uh, focus from one target to another and then evaporate a different material. So, in this process say for example, uh, you are seeing here that you can have um, uh, this is the hard metal that you have. So, 
uh, this is the metal base metal that you have and on that you have the titanium addition layer. So, layer 2 is titanium and then you have titanium nitride coating. So, this is uh, uh, the this is the layer which is titanium nitride and uh, the titanium nitride on the top surface will also show some micro droplets. Now, why does micro droplets form because of uh, typically because of the um, uh, Gibbs Thompson effect that you actually um, form very small uh, uh, deposits which uh, because of large surface area actually gets its melting temperature reduced and as a result during deposition they tend to coagulate they because of surface tension forces they tend to coagulate and form a droplet. So, this is not desirable. So, one has to make sure that, that such non-uniformity is uh, avoided. Uh, we can also create a multi-layer titanium aluminum nitride. Say for example, in this coating what you are seeing is that this is the base substrate as usual like we said here the base substrate is again some kind of a metal and on top of that we have our titanium addition layer which is this layer. Then we have uh, titanium nitride layer and this is um, this in the next layer then we can have uh, multi layers. So, we can have multi layers of titanium aluminum nitride or aluminum nitride and so on. The point I am trying to make is that you actually uh, in the same chamber without breaking the vacuum without moving without needing the sample to be taken out you can make multiple coatings. Now, in all these cases there is one point which I have not mentioned, but would now like to uh, stress upon is the fact that whenever you are creating these kind of vapor deposited coating maybe they are very thin film, yet the substrate coating interface is very sharp. In other words if this is the uh, substance or substrate that we want to coat and this is the film that we have created. If you go across at the coating interface coating substrate interface you see if this is the composition whatever you are saying and this is the distance. So, the coating will have one composition and the substrate will have another and the interface is fairly sharp. Now, this sharp because of this sharp interface you cannot afford to make this thickness of the coating very large because in that case you build up very high amount of stress at the coating substrate interface and which can lead to uh, decohesion during use. On the other hand to if you want a very exotic coating like um, titanium nitride or titanium aluminum nitride on top of an nitrided steel or some other cutting tool you do not need very high uh, thickness coating. You would rather not have very thick coating because of the reason that uh, the mismatch will be substantial uh, and this can actually uh, lead to complete dequation. But this is the only way you can have such exotic coating created on top of a substrate. Otherwise, you cannot think of a single manufacturing or synthesis process by which you can have a steel, then you nitride and then you have uh, other kinds of nitrides like titanium nitride or uh, titanium carbonitrides or titanium aluminum nitride these kind of combinations. So, in order to have such combinations and the beauty of this process is that you actually can have a multi layer meaning I can have an alternate layer of. So, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3 and I can repeat this a number of times. So, I can have such multi layer coating and in the process I can make sure that the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch is minimized or marginalized and that would depend upon the relative thickness and the relative composition and obviously, the, uh, the, the lattice parameter and other important physical properties. So, to have a very thick layer directly on top is very difficult, but if I can have such multi layers then the adherence is improved and such a thin film coating actually will perform better under any kinds of aggressive conditions. 
So, time to recapitulate. So, what all we have discussed? We said uh, we first uh, now are have started discussing about thin film coating, and this uh, one of the most uh, versatile method would be physical vapor deposition, where the process involves evaporation of a very high vapor pressure material into the vapor state, and then allow them to deposit on any colder substrate. And that cold su substrate, in fact, if it is uh, if the vapor is allowed to go or to the chamber surface there also it gets deposited, but we do not want that. So, we want we create a certain trajectory, so that the component is placed on the path of the vapor the co where the vapor tends to move and uh, on and at that po part it could be a metal, it could be a silicon uh, semiconducting material which gets coated. So, um, there is no change in composition this is where we are different than the previous uh, methods that we have discussed. So, we exactly deposit what we have in the form of the target. Um, so, PVD can be very very uh, uh, useful technique for semiconductor industry, for tooling industry, for uh, precision measurement industry, metrological instruments industry, where we want exactly 2.5 micrometer or maybe 210 nanometer and not 220 nanometer. So, it can be very precise. The if we have he, heating we do need to evaporate, but that is a separate one. But if you also heat the substrate during deposition, then the interface that I was just talking about a few minutes ago, which is usually very sharp may not be that sharp anymore. So, there could be some amount of diffusion and in the process there could be better bonding. So, separate heating during the PVD process can be helpful. We actually can um, make sure that we are able to coat uniform by having multiple targets or uh, having a, a vapor zone much wider than the component that we want to get uh, coated. We also can make sure that uh, the coating is more uniform by have creating a plasma inside by introducing certain amount of argon. Um, if we want to um, create a thicker coating, then we must be aware that this could lead to decohesion because of the stresses generated at the interface. So, we can coat pure metal, we can coat compounds, we can coat alloys. In fact, we can make a non stoichiometric alloy and rapidly solidify or simply uh, blend different types of powders, crush them, mill them and then sinter them together, create a target and use that target. The target probably should in that case be able to achieve a right composition and then use that target as our target for deposition. So, we are able to then deposit a very new and a very exotic and a non stoichiometric composition onto the component that we want to coat. We can make multi-layer coatings uh, as I was saying that we can make A, B, C or A, B or we can vary the thickness of A, B, C sequentially all by controlling the process parameters of uh, uh, PVD. And uh, we actually can make a modified PVD technique whereby we introduce certain gases, allow them to react and then form a coating thin film which is not pure uh, say tin, but tin oxide or zinc not zinc, but zinc oxide and in the process we actually can create certain devices or certain sensors or other kind of applications with a microstructure which is very exotic and not possible by conventional techniques. So, we stop here now and then um, in the next lecture we will discuss uh, a special technique of uh, PVD called sputtering. Thank you very much.